Hi, my name is Jess from Multiplicity and Me, a channel dedicated to ending the myths of DID, also known as Dissociative Identity Disorder. Okay, this has been a highly requested video for some time now. Um, I'd done a live stream um, when we announced that we'd had a baby but still people's curiosities were piqued and wanted to know more so this is a video that's going to cover that hopefully and answer those questions. So as you guys know, not only do I have DID but I also have a nine month old baby and she really is my life. There's nothing better on this planet than her to me. There's nothing like the unfairness of the stigma that I've had about my rights to have a child. You know, I've gotten some horrendous comments over the years and some things include things like don't breed, which is just awful. But that is the general consensus. It's like, okay, somebody has a mental health disorder and therefore they can't have children, which is absolutely bonkers. Why is it fair that people like me go through their trauma through no fault of their own, develop this disorder through no fault of their own, and yet they get penalised for life, they get stigmatised against for life and have that prejudice follow them for life, that persecution saying, you know what, people like you shouldn't have children. You know, and that put me off, that made me think, you know what, maybe I shouldn't have kids, maybe, you know, despite everything that happened to me as a child, despite everything that I went through, through no fault of my own, through someone else's selfish behaviour, now I have to live with being childless the rest of my life. But you know what? No, that wasn't an option and the time was right for us, everything was right for us and so we went ahead and had the most gorgeous baby girl. Okay, so some background. My husband and I, Gareth, have been together 11 years now. We got married in February 2016 and we've been trying for a baby ever since. I think stability is such a key word in being a parent, like no matter your circumstances or background. I think stability, if you can have it, if you're fortunate to have it, is certainly key. I think if you can aim for that concrete foundation in kind of as many aspects of your life as possible, I think that sort of is the best time to have a baby. And that's what we aimed for. So we had all this kind of stability around and around this point, of course, I was in a safe environment. My mental health was stable and I was in a happy, committed relationship with a roof over our head. Um, the moment we were married in 2016, we began to try for a baby, but it just didn't really seem to happen. This is where I felt kind of mental health had the biggest impact on us because the PTSD part of the DID kept interfering. Um, you know, because obviously to try for a baby, you need to do things to try for a baby. And that to me is extremely triggering and kept pushing me back. We were both checked over at the doctors after almost two years of trying and the doctor said, look, there's nothing wrong with you. You're both fit and healthy. Um, you know, try for a little longer and we'll see what happens. So I kind of came to that conclusion of, right, okay, well, there's nothing wrong with us physically, which I think was reassuring to know. But I was like, well, it must be mentally, you know, it must be this PTSD you know, these, these difficult, this difficulty, this kind of reluctance to do what I'm supposed to be doing to have a baby. So maybe now is the right time to try and trauma process. So I asked the GP if I could get some help with those memories and the sexual trauma that I endured as a child um, to see if that would help. Because I guess I was finding the conception process very difficult, as you guys can probably imagine. Nothing really has seemed to have worked until I met this amazing therapist who was more than understanding and willing to help me achieve what I wanted to achieve. And she was completely willing to help me process my past. And it's so typical because by our next meeting, I had fallen pregnant. <laughs> okay, eyes definitely closed. Oh boy, I hope it's a hamster. Your eyes definitely closed. Yeah. Flatter than that with your hands. Okay, don't do anything yet uh, until uh, I say so. Uh, now yeah. look. No. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> you are not serious. I'm pregnant! <laughs> Oh, fuck! 
Oh my god. <laughs> Rather than delving into my past and opening up this can of worms that DID does so well to hide and keep away from you, we decided that it would be best if it was put onto the back burner and instead I was shipped over to the perinatal team by my choice. My concern now was to make sure that I could be the best parent that I could possibly be. Um, I mean, this is it was such an unknown territory for me. I didn't know how I'd react and what I needed to do, I guess. Now it was finally here, it was like kind of like, whoa, okay, I really need to get prepared now. You know, I really need to put things in line. So the perinatal team are a service that support um, mothers with their mental health. So kind of before and after having a baby. So it's kind of like an early intervention to manage mental health so um, and kind of minimize the risk of developing you know postnatal depression and postnatal psychosis and things like that so if you kind of hit high risk factors then you're offered perinatal team which I thought was fantastic because of course I wanted to safeguard myself as well from going through those experiences. So of course you need two things to have DID, you need trauma and you need disorganised attachments and I absolutely wanted to minimise any risk of not bonding with my baby. I wanted to be the most responsive and loving parent I could possibly be. So I wanted to approach these services to not only ensure that I would get the support and help that I needed but also if they had any constructive criticisms or concerns that I could work on before my baby arrived so, you know, again, this was new territory for me and having this disorder and having a baby, yeah, okay, you know, I know I shouldn't worry about it, but you can't help worrying about it again, especially since society tells you so bluntly that children shouldn't be born with you, you shouldn't raise kids, you're not in a position to have children. So, yeah, it was something I really wanted to do. So the perinatal team were amazing. I had a specialist mental health midwife and also a specialist psychologist. So my first bit of advice is if you're able to approach services in your area that offer these kinds of support, definitely do so. One of my biggest worries was after having a baby, and I think, you know, being open about it on YouTube as well was a big thing, was that I would get a knock from social services because someone out there would be like, ah, oh, well, she's not a good enough mum, so, I'm gonna do that, you know? And that was such a big fear of mine. Um, basically, in the end, kind of doing that with perinatal team meant that I was kind of within social services and I'd already made myself known. I was kind of like, hey, you know, my car's out on the table. This is the disorder that I suffer with. I wanna make sure that I'm gonna be a good mum. I want you guys to make sure that you don't have any concerns and then it's kind of like case closed. Obviously, being a first time parent, the journey of birth um, would be an unexpected one. You can't anticipate how you're going to be on the day, but with the midwife, we had planned the just in cases. So we'd plan the flashbacks or all the chronic dissociation and, you know, if an unfamiliar part from the depths somewhere that we don't know about sort of came forward and didn't know what was happening, you know, so we kind of gone through all those what if and minimized all of those risks as much as we could. So we'd had like a plan for each one, which made me feel more reassured, you know, that something would be done if something went wrong quote unquote. You know, we'd also discuss the best ways to improve attachments, you know, sort of immediately. So it was things like, um, you know, doing some mindfulness and listening to my baby sort of pre-birth and, and leading up to the birth itself. And then it was also things like establishing breastfeeding and immediate skin to skin when the baby was born. So we'd gone through things like that that I wanted to put a definite yes by, like, please make sure this, this and this happens because I want to increase my chances and maximise my chances of having a positive attachment with my baby. So I was eight days overdue when I gave birth. Um, since my due date, my blood pressure had been high, so they had taken me into hospital to induce me. It was like about five o'clock in the morning, I woke up with the start of contractions, and they think they were due to induce me at seven, so I was very close. <laughs> but Evie was like, no, I'm ready now, so we went, we went ahead. The pain was so much worse than I expected. I don't remember it. They kind of say, you know, when you give birth, it's like all those hormones and the rushes of adrenaline and stuff mean that you kind of forget the pain, otherwise you'd never have children again, which I guess is kind of true. Um, I likened it, I just remember the description, and I likened it to a truck being run over my hips repeatedly every time a wave would happen. It was horrendous. But that's beside the point. The moment I started having contractions, I felt like my head was quieter than it 
had ever been before. It was the most bizarre feeling. People often ask how the boys, like how alters deal with being pregnant. I mean, obviously beforehand, if you're planning to have a baby, you would have discussed this at length as much as possible with your system and everyone should be happy to proceed. Secondly, things happen so slowly. Like all of the changes just really sneak up really, really slowly. Um, so day by day, they seem unnoticeable. But I suppose, I suppose the system kind of treated it like we had broken an arm. So the boys wouldn't have a broken arm themselves, you know, so on their inner world, none of them would have a broken arm, but obviously the body does. So they need to be careful and they know that. So the moment they come out, they're very aware of this very important thing that they need to do. And so that was how we all treated the baby growing within us, you know, with a lot of sensitivity, with a lot of awareness, and it was fine. It affected Jake's dysphoria more than anyone else when we began to show. So he didn't resurface then for some months after we'd given birth. So I was only, I mean, I, w I had quite a small bump. So I think it was only sort of noticeable about six and a half, seven months, and that's when Jake went into hiding. Which again is understandable, and that was kind of him practicing his own self-care, you know? So he'd gone as far on this journey as he could for me, and he was like, I, I can't anymore, and I'll kind of see you in a while, and that was fine. The birth went really well, but um, I didn't have any waters. I didn't see them go at any point, so the birth was very difficult and dry. Oh, I was in incredible pain and found the afterbirth much harder to deal with mentally than the birth itself, which I didn't anticipate at all. And I think you're running on all that adrenaline when you're in labour, but at home, once all that's cleared and you're left with a pain that's very tough, um, very, very tough, the body memories were excruciating. And yet I found Evie the most grounding thing in the world. I refused to let my dissociation take even a second away from making sure that I was present for her. And again, you know, you kind of get these rushes of hormones and I could feel them, you know, they really helped me kind of stick to the present like glue. I could barely stand or walk and I saw an at-home midwife every day for almost a month to check on my recovery, both physically and mentally. Again, and I think that was actually very reassuring. It wasn't like, okay, you give birth, by, you know, somebody came by to check on me, make sure that we were both okay, that we were both managing. And for someone to be like, you know what, I know you're in pain, I know this is affecting you, but you're doing so well. And I think that did really help, it really did. And we got through it. We made it and I started to heal. <gasps> is that right? <laughs> advice for any mums to be, let alone DID parents, is to get as much sleep as you possibly can. I wanted to exclusively breastfeed EV from the get-go, but I was more exhausted than I'd ever been in my life. And so Gaz took over with bottle feeding with formula at night for the first two weeks, just the first two weeks, so I could kind of rebuild back up my strength and get that much needed sleep. And it was just until my milk supply came in and um, yeah, I could sort of breastfeed really well and much easier from here on there. And those two weeks really got me through the next few months and beyond. It really, oh, it helped me endlessly. I love you. <laughs> I love you too. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. I love you. <laughs> Sleep is incredibly important for your mental health, as you guys may know. And although I didn't want to be without my baby for even a second, I knew that I had no choice but to allow Gaz to help and take over. So don't be afraid to ask for help and don't be afraid to get that because I often felt like I was going to let down Evie by not being there for her 24 7 but you need to put your self-care first you're not a bad parent for allowing yourself time to rest and recuperate when you need to so what are the facts I guess about people with DID being parents 
the ISSTD state that people with DID can be both good or bad parents, which is basically the same as the rest of society, right? Who knew? <laughs> but the difference for us is that we have more obstacles to face to ensure that our symptoms won't get in the way, and neither will any sort of family links that may still be present interfere, so no cycle of abuse will continue. So you kind of need to make sure that, you know, you're not in a situation that's gonna affect your baby you know, so your past isn't going to interfere with your present because of course you want to protect that baby more than anything. So your safety, security, stability are all in check. So Citran.org state, many DID patients are excellent parents who have made commitments not to recreate the patterns of abuse that existed in their families of origin. After a proper course of treatment specifically for dissociative disorders, it is possible that even people who have had bad periods of compromised parenting can be successful and nurturing parents. I hope that puts people's minds at rest about whether or not people with DID or mental health or whatever it may be can have children. You know, again, it base it's on your circumstance. Don't let the rest of the world stop you. You have that family that you may not have had growing up. Even if you've had a bad family in the past, don't let it stop you making a new one for your future. Hey, where is she? Peekaboo! Where is she? Where's Evie? Where's she gone? Where's Evie? Where is she? Peekaboo! Where is she? And if there's anything else you'd like to know, obviously please leave them in the comments below. We do read every single comment, um, even if we don't get time to reply. Um, it's all very much appreciated so thank you ever so much and if you'd like don't forget to like comment share and subscribe that would be fantastic and don't forget we have plenty of social media so Facebook Tumblr Twitter Instagram and Patreon for anyone who is interested and the links to the, all of those are down below okay thank you everyone so much for watching and I hope you have a wonderful day bye everyone bye 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 I'm a baby and I must do business, have to get my business things done today.